Welcome to SCP-105. We are on our sixth discussion of topics related to life in the universe. That means we're halfway through with the course, which is very amazing. So far, we've been discussing what the definitions of life are, what life is made out of, the atoms that make life up, the chemicals that make life up and the different forms of life that can live in extreme environments. We've also learned about light and how light can be used to learn about very distant places in our universe and perhaps hopefully to help us find evidence for life out beyond the earth. Today we will talk about a very important aspect of the universe, an aspect of the universe that governs the motion of most things, and also the environments where we expect many living things thrive, including the living things here on Earth. This aspect of the universe is known as gravity, and it has been a very confusing idea for thousands of years. The first scientific understanding of gravity really only started to develop about 400 years ago, according to all the records we have from people who have thought about this idea around the world. And then it was only about 100 years ago when the current understanding of gravity that we now know to be as accurate a model as possible was first invented. This was invented by Albert Einstein, and the theory goes by the name, the general theory of relativity. When it was first invented, it was considered to be almost too difficult for anyone to understand. At least that was the story that was given in the popular press. And indeed, Einstein's theory of general relativity involves some very complicated and difficult mathematics. At least it's a lot of mathematics to keep track of. And when you start to work through it, you quickly come to realize that there are many, many, many equations that you end up having to keep track of to fully explain and describe what we call gravity. But we don't need to know all of those equations to get a sense for what Einstein's explanation for how gravity works does. And so we are going to start with our understanding that Einstein's theory of general relativity is the correct description of gravity. And as we look into that description, hopefully we'll find some interesting facts about gravity that we can do and use to make some predictions about the conditions on planets or in solar systems, or indeed in the universe as a whole. That's what we'll be talking about today. So I am going to share with you this presentation on gravity. And the presentation has accompanying it some comments that I put in for each slide. This will be posted so that you could read through those comments. But I'll have some additional comments to make myself as we look at the different ways of thinking about the phenomena that are connected to gravity. This first diagram I'm showing indicates how complicated the motion is in our galaxy. Our sun is one of 100 billion, that's 10 to the 11 stars in our galaxy, which is spread out as a flat pancake like disk. The galaxy is approximately 100,000 light years from one end to the other, and the sun is moving through it in sort of a path 
that takes it about 200 million years or so to travel on one circuit. Now we don't often notice this motion because the distances in our galaxy are so great that we don't see changes from night to night or even over the course of a human lifetime. 200 million years is a very long time after all. But by measuring the motions of stars carefully and by making some very interesting observations of how everything is organized around our own star, we have been able to determine what direction the sun is moving through the galaxy. And what you can see in this diagram is what that path looks like as we look up at the sky and look at that galaxy that is essentially the home for our own star and all of the stars we see in the night sky. That path around the Milky Way, you can see, follows along in that disk that goes a little bit above and a little bit below it over the 200 million years. But that's not the only thing that's moving. While the sun is moving around the galaxy, the Earth is also moving around the sun. And of course, the Earth is moving at a much faster rate. This is a rate that is noticeable to human perception over the course of some days. And the entire cycle takes one year. That path that the Earth takes around the sun is also diagrammed on this picture. Of course, the sizes relative of these paths are exaggerated, or we might say projected, so that you can see them clearly. It's not indicating that the Earth is swinging wildly outside of this galaxy. In fact, if we were to draw this to scale, you wouldn't be able to see the motion of the Earth around the sun. But we do want to get a sense for how the tilt is oriented. The motion of the sun around the galaxy is not in the same plane as the motion of the Earth around the sun. And you can see that clearly in this diagram. Month by month, we have a satellite, the moon, that orbits the Earth. And it orbits in a plane that is similar, but not the same as the plane that the Earth moves around the sun. In. And you can see that illustrated as well with the moon orbit. The moon's orbit and the ecliptical plane are very similar. And you can see that those two ellipses, which is the shape that we see these orbits taking, are um, fairly close to aligned with each other. You can also see the direction that the sun and the earth are rotating, that is spinning around their axes. The sun spins around its axis over the course of some weeks. It's not easy for us to observe that directly. We have to use special telescope that can see sunspot, sunspot blemishes on the sun as it rotates around. But the Earth, we know, spins around approximately once every day. We see that in terms of sunrise and sunset. And that's indicated by the line that extends to the axis of the Earth and a little circle that indicates the spinning of the Earth around that axis. Same thing is true for the sun. All of these motions are happening all at once. And some of these motions are determined by different physical processes. So the spinning of the Earth and the Sun are determined by the initial motions that the solar system had as it formed. And the planes that this motion happens in for the Earth and the Moon are also determined by those initial formations. 
But what keeps the Earth moving around the sun and what keeps the moon moving around the Earth is a phenomenon we call gravity. And that's what we would like to understand. It's also the phenomenon that keeps the sun moving around the galaxy, at least in terms of the changing path that these things are taking. If uh, there was no gravity, all objects would just move in straight lines, either away or towards each other, depending on which way they were oriented. But because there's gravity, there's a cycle, there's a circuit, there's an orbit that gets formed. And we're going to explore how those orbits are formed, what causes them, and how we can think about the processes that allow for orbits to exist. And hopefully that will help you understand and even make predictions about different situations out there in space, places you will not ever visit, but can figure out precisely what's going on using just our understanding of gravity. So this is the way a lot of people first are introduced to general relativity, our understanding of gravity. The idea is that space is sort of filled with a grid and that anywhere there is some object that has mass, and because we know that mass is a form of energy, we really mean anywhere there is some concentration of energy, that grid is bent or curved in a slight way, just as though you were placing an object in a, on a sheet and allowing it to indent just like this. That's often the explanation that's given for gravity in terms of general relativity. And it's not too bad. In fact, mass and energy do curve space. They warp it in such a way to cause some of these phenomena we're talking about. But students often get confused by this description because space is not a blanket that extends everywhere. It's three-dimensional. And to think about curvature happening in three dimensions is a lot more difficult than thinking about what a curvature of a sheet in two dimensions looks like. People have tried to draw or visualize what that might be. And there have been some successes and some less successful attempts at that. I can show you one example. Here's an example of somebody who is trying to describe how the space surrounding a massive gravitating object is distorted or curved by the gravity that that massive object causes. I find this a little bit confusing, but perhaps you can gain some insight by seeing an image like this. This is a more common visualization of that warping of space. And this one was calculated carefully to describe how a certain slice of space would behave as a curved thing if there was a massive star placed in that space. Now, what you see here is a funnel of sorts. And that funnel is a little bit confusing because it's not a real funnel in space. We don't actually have something for space to curve into to create that sort of funnel all of the trajectories follow those paths as though there was something for space to curve into. But when we saw in the previous diagram, there really isn't. It's just the distortion that happens around the massive object. But because we only have our understanding of the world that we interact with to be able to describe these things, unless you're willing to use the mathematics that Albert Einstein came up with, we're going to use the funnel as an 
way of visualizing or imagining what the warping and curving of space looks like around a gravitating object. So that's what we have present here. When you look at that shape, it looks very similar to other mathematical forms that people were investigating when Newton, Isaac Newton, first came up with his understanding of gravity and people began to develop that. Isaac Newton thought of gravity as a force between two different objects, pulling them together. And he calculated the various features of that force. But quickly people began to realize that those calculations became very, very complicated. And there were lots of contests for hundreds of years after Newton to try to calculate as accurately as possible all the different forces that might happen in our solar system. Some of those problems are so difficult that people are still working on them to this day. Other people thought there must be an easier way to think about these things, and they didn't discover a completely easier way, but they did discover a way of thinking about things that turns out to match very well what Albert Einstein discovered about gravity. And that is to think about gravity in terms of energy. Last week, we discussed a form of energy called potential energy. The idea is that in an environment where you can move far enough away from some source of potential energy, you can gain potential energy or lose potential energy, depending on where you are. In a gravitational field, or in a place where gravity is occurring, you can raise an elevation to a point where you have a very high potential energy. That corresponds to the outskirts of a funnel, like what you're seeing in this diagram here. As you move towards the gravitating object, you go down the walls of the funnel and you decrease in gravitational potential energy. And the exact way that you increase and decrease follows the contours exactly of the curvature of the space that's predicted by Albert Einstein. Physicists call this curvature a potential. And that's how we're going to start to think about gravity, as these potentials, or sometimes we call them potential wells, because they're shaped like wells, these dimples or funnels that slope downwards towards the gravitating object. This is an example of people calculating the potential wells using general relativity. This is actual data that people have developed and calculated using Einstein's mathematics and some ideas about massive objects. In this situation, we have two massive objects, one that's a little bit lighter than the other. And I think you can tell which one has less mass than the other, because the one with less mass produces a smaller potential at well than the one with greater mass. What will happen in these situations is these potential wells will move around each other, and they will follow the movement around each other in a way that conserves energy. Kinetic energy is exchanged for potential energy as an object falls to a lower value of potential energy in another gravitating object's potential. The detailed calculations of how this works are something that we won't get into, but we will use the results of this understanding to explore some of the more interesting gravitational situations in our universe. So here's an example of a cartoon version of the potential wells that are forming around the Earth 
and the moon according to general relativity and according to our modern understanding of gravity. What you can imagine in these cases is that an object that's near the surface of the earth needs to gain a significant amount of energy to leave the earth's potential well. And if it gains enough, it can go as far away as it wants. Imagine, for example, a spacecraft that wanted to travel from the earth to the moon. Well, it would have to gain a significant amount of energy to leave the earth. But then, if it wanted to enter the gravitational potential well of the moon, if it had too much energy, it might not be able to stay in that potential well. It might go in and right back out again. So adjustments are made so that you lose the right amount of energy to stay in the potential well of the moon. This is how we transfer from the earth to the moon. And you have to make those calculations carefully and change the energy in just the right way, which really is a transforming of the energy in just the right way to move from the earth to the moon in exactly the way you'd like. Here we have the cartoon version of what I've been describing. These are the gravity wells of our entire solar system. And what I like about this diagram which was produced by Randall Monroe, who is a comic strip artist for nerds, is that it shows all of the different planets in our solar system and how deep their gravitational wells are, but also shows why and how various satellites, what we call moons of these planets are bound to the planets that they're orbiting. Let's take, for example, the Earth and the Moon. The previous diagram I showed had the Earth and the Moon potential wells, but in the context of our whole solar system, you can see that the Moon is dominated in terms of the potential wells that are right around it by the Earth. If the Moon were to try to escape the Earth, it would have to get over one of those boundary walls that you can see on either side. So this indicates that the moon is bound to the earth. Mars, on the other hand, is beyond one of those boundary walls. So it's not bound to the earth at all. It is bound to another object, which is way off on the lower left-hand side of this diagram. That's the sun. And you can see it goes all the way down there. So the borders between each of these planets really indicate where they're dominating their gravitational potentials. You can also see some of the moons of Jupiter bound within their gravity wells. There is a moon of Saturn that's indicated bound within one of Saturn's gravity wells. And the rings of Saturn sit fairly low in the potential well of Saturn as well. In this understanding of gravity, we have a very good sense for why things stay close to each other and why things move apart from each other if there's gravity in the situation. So let's try to move objects away from the Earth. And we would normally do that today using rockets. The first person to think about the possibility for moving things away from the Earth and having them never fall back to the planet was Isaac Newton. Isaac Newton, of course, was famous for having an understanding of gravity, at least according to the story, that was inspired by an apple falling on his head. And sometimes people say that Newton discovered gravity, which isn't quite true. Isaac Newton came up with an explanation for gravity, 
And according to his explanation, some very interesting things had to be true. One of the things he realized had to be true was that the moon had to be bound to the earth in a very similar way to the way we were bound to the earth. But the difference was that the moon was moving at a constant rate or very close to a constant rate, whereas we were staying still. And that was the entire difference between an object that was bound and weighted down on the surface of the earth and an object that was moving around the earth in what we call an orbit. Now this understanding was sort of surprising to people, but as he explained it and used the mathematics he developed to uh, offer the explanation, people realized this had to be what was going on. Now Newton didn't have a rocket to think about. So instead, he thought about the fastest thing he could, and that was a cannon. At the time, cannonballs traveled the fastest speed that anyone could create. Newton imagined what it would be like to put a cannon on the tallest mountain on Earth, one that extended above the atmosphere so that there wouldn't be any air resistance to slow the cannonball down. And he imagined firing that cannonball off at different speeds. At a slow speed, the cannonball would travel in an arc, we call it projectile motion, and it would move towards the center of the earth. That trajectory is one that follows the curving of space in the potential well. But of course, Newton didn't know that. He calculated it as an interaction between forces, the gravitational force of the planet interacting with the motion of the cannonball. Well, if you move slowly, the object travels a little ways before being pulled towards the center of the Earth or traveling on a trajectory that is moving more towards the lower potential energy parts of the well rather than towards higher potential energy parts of the well. But as you add more energy or more speed, you travel at shallower and shallower trajectories. So B, you end up traveling a bit further. And in fact, you can, as you go faster and faster, fall further and further away as the earth is round. And so the cannonball falls around the curving of the earth. So Newton quickly realized that there was a speed you could fire a cannonball on where that object would move in the same curve that the Earth's own roundness took. And eventually that object would move all the way around the Earth and come back to where it started. That's called a closed orbit. And in its um, lowest energy form, it's a circular orbit. But what if you added a little bit more energy? Well, if you add a little bit more energy, the orbit becomes a different shape. That shape is elliptical. And you can see that in D. In this situation, the object has enough energy to be able to move a little bit outside of where it started in the potential well, but not far enough so that it escapes entirely. Eventually, it comes back around. We call that shape an elliptical shape. That's an elliptical orbit. Newton predicted that. But Newton also predicted that if you gave enough energy, which is to say enough speed to a cannonball, it would travel on a trajectory that would never return from where it started. These trajectories are called either parabolic or hyperbolic trajectories. And as they move away from the Earth, they get further and further away because they have enough energy to completely escape the potential well. The speed you have to travel to escape a potential well at a given location inside the potential well is called the escape speed. At the surface of the Earth, 
the escape speed is about 11 kilometers per second. On the other hand, the speed you need to just circle around an object and not crash into it, or another way of saying that is the speed you need to stay at the potential energy you started at and never decrease is called the orbital speed. And every location has both an escape speed and an orbital speed. Here at the surface of the Earth, the escape speed is 11 kilometers per second. And the orbital speed is a little bit slower at about eight kilometers per second. Now, some people are surprised when I talk about orbiting at the surface of the Earth. Surely you can't do that. Well, it turns out that the International Space Station, for example, is orbiting very close to eight kilometers per second. And the reason that it is so close to the orbital speed we calculate for the surface of the Earth is because the International Space Station isn't that far away from us when it's directly overhead. It is about 100 kilometers up, but compared to the 6,300 kilometer radius of the Earth, that's a very small change in where it is located according to the potential well of the planet. And so the orbital speed of the International Space Station is for the purposes of looking in the biggest picture, basically the same as the orbital speed that you would calculate at the surface of our planet. So these trajectories that objects take in gravitational potential wells are well understood and well studied. In fact, they were known about before Isaac Newton even, because all of the planets in our solar system follow these trajectories. Now, we didn't necessarily know what these shapes were when we first started looking at them in the nighttime sky. We thought they might be circles. We thought that they might be strange paths that went around the Earth. But an astronomer by the name of Johannes Kepler and a mathematician who studied these movements of the planets in the night sky with respect to the sun discovered that these movements were actually in the shape of ellipses. These are the same ellipses that we see in trajectory D. Every planet moved around the sun, he calculated, in this sort of ellipse. And the sun wasn't at the exact center of the ellipse, it was offset at a location we call the focus. The focus of an ellipse is something that forms a pair of two focal points in a way that mimics the center of a circle, but it's a little bit different. We'll explore what the definition of that is in other contexts, but you can see what the shape is in this diagram here. Now, people often know that the shape of orbits isn't exactly circular around the sun. And so sometimes they'll draw pictures like this to exaggerate the elliptical nature of the path that the Earth takes around the sun. But this is very exaggerated, I want to emphasize. In fact, this is to scale what the paths of the first four planets around the sun look like. And you can see on that scale that it's very difficult to see the difference between these paths and circles. If you look carefully, you can see there's a little bit of an offset and that the paths are not exactly circular. They're a little bit squash, but they're closer to circles than they are to ellipses to my eye. And they are definitely ellipses. But in many situations in this class, we'll assume that they're circles. There will be a little bit of adjustment and uncertainty and error in that calculation, but not enough to change the results substantially. Of course, if you were going to fly a rocket ship from one place to another, you'd want to get that exactly right. But if you just want to get a sense for what's going on, Thinking that the planets are traveling around the sun in circles isn't as bad as some other approaches you might take.
This is a diagram of a different star system out there in space. This is the TRAPPIST-1 system. TRAPPIST-1 is a star that has a significant number of planets orbiting around it. In fact, they're still trying to figure out exactly how many. You can see here that there's at least seven that are going around this star and they travel around it relatively quickly in a matter of days. The star is much smaller than our sun. The orbits are much closer into the star than the orbits of the planets in our solar system. But because the star is much cooler, it's a red star, that means that there are some planets, if you calculate the temperature on those planets, that end up being close to the temperature here on Earth. That's intriguing for our class. But one thing that is also very interesting is that the paths of these planets, just as the paths of all planets around all stars, follow the same rules as the planets moving around our own sun. Those rules are governed by this fundamental feature of the universe, gravity. So this is the elliptical paths that these planets are traveling around their own star. In this situation, it's even more difficult to tell that these are elliptical paths. They look very, very close to circular. Now, of course, it's not just planets moving around stars that are described by our understanding of gravity. In fact, everything that has mass, everything that has a significant amount of energy. Mass energy is usually what we consider because that's the highest concentration of mass we see around us, the highest concentration of energy we see around us. Anything that has that concentration will interact gravitationally. And while we were looking at individual stars and planets, you can imagine scaling up to entire galaxies and calculating the motion that these galaxies would have throughout the universe. This is a artist's conception of doing such a thing. Now this motion is happening on a completely different scale. You might recall that the sun traveled around our galaxy once every 200 million years. Talking about the motions between galaxies often invokes billions of years, much longer time frames than we usually consider. If you look at the motion of galaxies further away, you find that they're moving in ways that look almost unusually unnatural if you were to compare them to the gravitational motion of planets. And there have been lots of work done to sort of see whether that motion can be described using Einstein's theories of general relativity. What's been surprising is that when you use Einstein's theory of general relativity, there are certain predictions that are made according to the motion of the galaxies in our universe. And one of the predictions that's made is that the universe might be getting to a situation where galaxies are further and further apart from each other. We call that the expanding universe. And we see that in our own universe. That also predicts that earlier on the universe, the galaxies were closer together. And if you go back about 13 and a half billion years ago, you get to a point where all the galaxies were basically at the same location in space and have been expanding away from each other ever since. That moment when all the galaxies were in the same location, we call the Big Bang. The details of how all of that happened are the study of cosmology, which is a fascinating study, provides us with an understanding of the reality that's around us. And it's really tied into understanding this theory of gravity, general relativity, which explains how galaxies form and come together, as well as why they're moving apart from each other on the largest scales. This is an important thing to understand if what you're interested in is questions of ultimate existence, why is there a universe and how? 
a lot of these questions can't get answered simply by doing these calculations. But we do have a very clear understanding of different events that happened in our universe connected to this fact that our universe is expanding. And the calculations we can do to explain that are associated with general relativity. As we look out into space, we can also see some other strange things that are going on. Those warpings of space caused by gravity, those potential wells can be traced out by more distant light sources that travel near them and then end up getting deflected. And this is a image that shows this. This is called a gravitational lens. What you're seeing here is a galaxy that's sort of reddish colored. And behind it, about twice as far away, is another galaxy that's a little bit bluish in color. The light from that other galaxy would have gone off in other directions and be invisible to us, but for the fact that there was this potential well between us and the more distant galaxy, that caused the light to actually bend in trajectory and head back towards us. And we see that as a ring around the other galaxy. This was a prediction that Albert Einstein made, that if his ideas were correct, you would see these sorts of gravitational lenses out in space. And he predicted exactly what that would look like. Isaac Newton didn't really have that description when he was describing forces between two objects. Light doesn't have mass, so why should it travel on a different trajectory than um, what straight line would predict for it? Remember when we said at the very beginning that if there was no gravity, things would travel on straight lines, and Isaac Newton might say that light doesn't have mass, so it can't have gravity. But Albert Einstein says that light travels around the curvature of space and it will travel in a deflected way around a potential well and a very strong potential well, like the one associated with this galaxy, can cause a very strong deflection. And that's what we're seeing here a prediction that's verified and verifying. Albert Einstein's theory of general relativity. Another prediction that comes out of Albert Einstein's theory of general relativity is that very compact objects that start to orbit around each other very close will emit a form of radiation called gravitational radiation. Up till now, we've been talking about radiation as being light. And light is formed when you have accelerating electrical charges. Well, if you have accelerating masses, you can form another form of radiation that's associated with gravity. And those waves are actually waves of space, curving in and curving out, expanding, contracting. Those gravitational waves will travel out throughout the universe in much the same way that light travels throughout the universe. But they're very hard to detect. You need to have gravitational detectors that are miles in length. And there's two of them in the US and now a number of others around the world. These observatories are looking for these tiny distortions that are created by these extremely energetic events. For example, two black holes merging together. We can calculate what the gravitational radiation from such an event would look like. And we can measure that in our gravitational observatories. This is a new thing. It's only in the last seven years that we've been able to do this. But now we've discovered a whole new array of phenomena out in the universe a number of binary black holes that are merging together and forming these gravitational ripples that we can observe today.
So we're going to share this information with you moving on from here. But I hope this gives you a sense for the sort of amazing world of gravity. In class, we'll discuss some ways to calculate aspects of gravity. And you'll have to do some work that calculates those aspects of gravity as well. But that's something that's best left to work on on your own. Understanding that this is the way we see gravity in the modern world, that this is the way that scientists who work with gravity at its most fine detail calculate, I think is an important thing to understand. And it's a nice way to kind of rethink our understanding of the universe, which is a very different place perhaps than what you might expect just from what you see around you day to day. Thanks very much for joining me on this journey. I hope you enjoyed it and we'll see you again when we talk about the solar system.